This is TREP Wire Week in Review for week ending July 24th. I'm Martha Kocher with TREP, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with our subject matter experts, Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Joe McBride, Head of CRE Finance, and this week, our VP of Commercial Operations from London, Vivek Anand Datani, to give us a perspective from across the pond. This week, quarterly earnings reports shifted into second gear, and the results show the impact of the COVID headwinds. New jobless claims rise for the first time in 15 weeks, and U.S. and China tensions flare up, threatening global commerce. And those of you who are looking for an upside, another fiscal stimulus plan makes some progress along partisan lines with a focus on kids and jobs, and the U.S. has struck a deal to acquire a vaccine if proven safe and effective. So we'll look at the progress in perils, but first a slight detour. We have some loyal listeners that we'd like to give a shout out to, Joe D. in New Jersey, Dave in Summit, Scott in Cambridge, and Ralph D. And a remarkable story from Andrea in Wisconsin, who says her nine-year-old son is a fan of the podcast and our own Manus Clancy. Manus, you have the makings of a fan club. All I could say is go Badgers. I hope they get back on the field in September. They have a big game at the big house against Michigan. And uh, I've come to really enjoy Wisconsin football. So I hope we see a lot of it and a lot of success. Uh, and for the Packers as well. So uh, this made me think about something somebody in our office, well, in their home office on Zoom told us, which was, you know, for I've been working at TREP for seemingly forever, but probably like 10 years or something. And when people ask me what I do, uh, you know, Normally, they don't actually care, but when I try to explain it to them, they look at me with blank stares, right? So somebody, a uh, sales guy in our, in our company said, you should introduce them to Trep Wire, and it might actually explain a little bit about what you do. I don't think it would actually explain what we do day to day, but the market and CRE and CMBS. So he said, it's, you know, make your grandma subscribe. So at Thanksgiving dinner, she doesn't keep asking you what you do. Well, while we're on the topic of shout outs and thanks, um, we only started this in the spring and, and we've had tremendous growth. And I do believe when the Arbitron numbers come out, there's a good chance we get that number one ranking in the coveted segment of men that love tall buildings between the ages of 25 and 44. I think that that's, <laughs> uh, that's in the cards for us coming forward. Our growth has been so uh, terrific, but thank you everybody. Thank you for the, the listeners of Wisconsin, the Yankee Clippers, Steel City Dave, and the always entertaining RD. So uh, Joe from New Jersey is, prefers to be called Joe from Brooklyn. I think that's where he grew up. And it reminds me of a buddy that I know who used to call into sports radio. If you're from New York, you know the fan. And he would say he grew up in Yonkers and he moved to Scarsdale when he became an adult. But he would never say Vinny from Scarsdale. He would always say Vinny from Yonkers. So Joe D from Brooklyn, thanks for listening. Yeah, he, he walks his dog to the podcast. <laughs> so let's talk about what we saw this week and what some of the signs of progress and peril might be. Well, I'll start with the signs of progress. And these will be a little far afield. Some will be commercial real estate and some will be other things. On the commercial real estate side, we saw some new leases and property sales. Um, AIG signed three new leases, two of them in Manhattan. One will be near Rock Center. Uh, one will be in Liberty Street downtown and one in Jersey City. 600,000 feet in total, which will replace their existing lower Manhattan space. So if you're looking for green shoots, this is a bet by a big insurance company on the future of New York City and things coming back to normal. And, and that's a big um, vote of confidence by AIG. So a wonderful sign. We don't have details on what they're paying per square foot, but it is 600,000 square feet across the three locations. We did see BNP Paribas make a similar bet. They extended their lease in Midtown Manhattan. Um, they are downsizing from nearly 500,000 square feet to about 300,000 square feet, but another bet on New York City returning to normal which as a native New Yorker, that's a wonderful thing to see. Out in San Francisco, we saw 123 Townsend sell. That, is, that was reported by Commercial Real Estate Direct earlier in the week. 
their big tenant out there is PayPal, um, another sign of a market that might have been uh, muddled by COVID and tech firms looking to have work from home and other things. Um, the purchase of that building is a bet that that market will be resilient. We did see hotel occupancy tick up modestly, according to Smith Travel, 44% to 45% this week. Uh, anything that moves the needle north is a positive sign for that heavily uh, hit segment of the market. Commercial Mortgage Alert last week noted that the new Morgan Stanley conduit deal for, 40, for 16 of the 43 loans that are coming into that deal for securitization, 16 of the 43 were originated post-crisis. So there is some lending going on. Uh, American Campus Communities, another commercial real estate direct story, they have 112,000 beds nationwide. They said their occupancy thus far in July, 90.1% down from 93% last year. And that may seem like a negative, down 3%, but I think it's an enormous victory, um, only being down 3% uh, with all the uncertainty we have with schools opening in the fall. I think that is a heroic number. Uh, it, wouldn't surprise, it wouldn't have surprised me if it had been 70%. And it seems like they had some uptick in velocity in July. People had waited until the last minute to make their decision, but they saw some catch up in July. So all of those are positives for the market, um, which I'm happy to report. Um, we could see a very perilous August. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. The uncertainty that we will be looking at will be the ending of supplemental unemployment benefits the $600 a week, although there seems to be a deal for an extension that will be for something sharply less than $600 a week. We'll see how that goes, but that could be a uh, something which slows the economy in August. We clearly saw an uptick in hostility between the U.S. and China this week, uh, which is always a concern, uh, certainly on the trade front and, and whether or not a trade deal unravels there. We do know that borrowers in the CRE space that were granted relief in April and May will see that relief, their forbearance relief, or the ability to use reserves to keep their loans current. That will end in July, August, and September. So those borrowers will see an uptick in what they have to pay back. That may lead to more delinquencies later in the summer. We'll have to watch. And another element of uncertainty is whether or not schools open uh, in the fall, yeah, elementary schools and secondary schools. In my opinion, I think if they open, it's a positive sign for the economy. More people can get back to work. And if they don't, it will be um, more difficult for the economy to rebound in Q3 and Q4. It'll be positive for most of our psyches as well. <laughs> get back to some sense of normalcy. There's a, one or two other uh, items. One was huge uptick in uh, existing home sales in June and not totally surprising since they kind of fell off a cliff in May. Uh, but part of that is, you know, people getting restless and moving out of, you know, smaller apartments and out of the cities into the suburbs. Part of it is uh, all time lows and mortgage rates. So the people that are, you know, continuing to work through the pandemic are uh, looking to upgrade and looking to, you know, get some more space, get a little bit of a backyard the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, I'm sure you've all been seeing that and reading about it. It's seemingly had great results. Uh, they had a thousand patient trial. They're saying could be ready for mass production in September. And as the resident epidemiologist on this podcast, I will say that they're using a recombinant adenovirus vector method, which essentially they take the virus and they pluck off a piece of it that allows it to reproduce so that it, they can actually just inject you with the virus and not worry about it reproducing. So I think it, it's producing um, the antibodies and the T cells in, in you know, a rapid clip. So I think they're, they're moving on to a 30,000 person trial at this point. Uh, so there's a lot of hope on the, on the vaccine side, which is great. It reminds me of a conversation I had years ago with somebody touting to me the benefits of stem cells and they were talking about industrial accidents. And they were saying that at some point, 
doctors will stop reattaching like fingers and stuff like that. If there's like a saw accident or something and somebody loses a thumb, what they will do is they'll put stem cells on the thumb <laughs> and it will regenerate the, the thumb. And I said, what happens if you put on too much? Like, what happens then? Do you have to start again? I, I don't know. Like I, I chop I never it off any... and start all over again. Wow. I don't know. Well we're not doctors, but we play one on the podcast. So <laughs> Vivek, right. I'm going to ask you to give us what is happening from your vantage point. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much for having me today. I've been, uh, ever since listening to you guys week in, week out, been uh, waiting for the opportunity. So I really appreciate it. So building on uh, what Joe said about the University of Oxford, hopefully the British government um, got in there first, but yesterday it was announced that we did order 100 million um, doses. Of, of, of that vaccine in question, um, which is very good. And also there was another university in the UK, uh, University of Southampton, that have conducted a small trial, but a, a new treatment for, for COVID that reduces the number of patients that actually need intensive care. So um, that was pretty, pretty promising as well. So of course we have everything about COVID and how that's impacting the UK economy, which we'll go into a lot more detail. But one thing that I wanted to talk about was the B word that we've all seemed to have forgotten about, and that is Brexit. So at the end of the day, the UK has to leave the EU by the end of the year. And therefore trade negotiations, the ongoing situation with China and Hong Kong is, is slightly worrying. The relationship with the US is, is is as important as ever and we really need to focus on finalizing the trade deals with uh, EU and non-EU countries. And Brexit is always tied in how the government responds to it and it's, it's actually getting a lot of airtime now because I, I'm, I'm very happy to say that in terms of COVID cases in the UK we're, we're seeing uh, decreases each day in terms of number of cases, number of deaths. So we're now turning to trying to get back to normal, which is, which is really promising. So with Brexit, there's, there's been a lot of grants and loans that the UK um, government have provided for COVID, but bringing it back to Brexit, there's, they're talking about an increase on taxation on buy-to-let properties. And buy-to-let properties have already been pretty hammered over the last couple of years um, in terms of uh, tax relief being taken away. And now increasing taxation on that, um, as well as a new, um, a new idea came out yesterday that the government to pay back all of the money they were given to the UK population through COVID is a way of increasing the capital gains tax on property sales as well. So when you think about um, the knock-on effect that this is going to happen to the loan market, to then the CMBS, the European, uh, well, the UK CMBS market, it's going to have a pretty bad knock-on effect. And then to make matters even more interesting is uh, UK companies have to pay a business rate on, the, on their commercial property. And uh, a big impact on that, uh, where, uh, how that business rate is calculated is on the value of that commercial property. So this is only uh, conducted about every five to seven years. And the last valuation was done in 2015, pre-COVID and pre-Brexit. So businesses who are already struggling because of COVID uh, are now having to pay higher rates based on the valuation of their commercial property before all of this market, these market dislocations happen. So there's been a lot of fallout um, from that in terms of the, the consequences that already struggling businesses are going to have and then the knock-on effect that will have on commercial real estate properties in the UK. But that being said, the way the UK government has handled this whole pandemic um, by finance, providing a lot of financing, being very supportive, um, closing a lot, of, um, a lot of places early, and now reopening the economy too, I think has been, um, has been very promising. And then the schools have also started to reopen. Um, they're now close. It was only for a short time because summer holidays started pretty soon after they reopened. But we're hoping that the schools will be back in September, which will mean that which will have a great effect on the UK economy because we can all then get back to work too. The valuation thing is very interesting, and it'll be very interesting here in the U.S. Uh, we have a very robust um, service that we offer to appraisers in the U.S. to various states and localities. 
that use our data to come up with valuations and, and comparables for how um, offices and retail properties and other things should be valued for tax purposes. Um, uh, our colleague Lonnie was on a couple weeks ago talking about that. In fact, we should probably have him on to address this again. And now what you're talking about is a situation where there's just probably the makings of an epic debate for how do you value something like a hotel that has sat 90% empty for the last three months. And what is fair value for that? How should you assess that? And I'd love to get Lonnie back on to get his assessment. And we do have that, actually that service also for borrowers that also utilize us to come up with to, vehicles to make sure that they are not over assessed compared to some of their other properties. So I think there's a lot of debate to be had on this subject and I think uh, it'll be very contentious across the U.S., uh, hopefully less so in the U.K. Well, you know, you mentioned the um, capital gains tax to pay for the COVID relief. We're already starting to see those types of rumblings in the U.S., you know, out of uh, the Democratic Party on, you know, removing 1031 exchanges, which basically lets you delay capital gains taxes until way down the line when you end up selling properties later. Um, but what is promising or what, what is positive is that, you know, you guys were back to school before the end of the last school year. And, you know, right. you guys got hit with this before we did and you recovered or are recovering seemingly before we are. Uh, but hopefully you're an indicator of, you know, where we'll be in a few months. I mean, I, I hope and I pray. And one other thing that I always try to mention is that, you know, the UK or Germany, let's say, or Sweden, or any one of these countries is like the size of New York State, right? So yeah. the, we, cannot, we can't really compare the, uh, the way that the virus spread or the way that it was controlled, you know, between something that is, you know, the size of New York State versus the size of the entire, you know, United States. So especially with our disparate governments and everything else all over the place. So it's going to take longer for it to ripple through our country and it's going to take longer to recover the recovery to ripple through. But I'm hoping that, you know, New York, New Jersey, the early States that got hit hard are going to be some of the early ones to recover, which I think we're starting to see that. I think that makes sense. When you look at, when we were going through this, I always looked at how Italy were doing because Italy were four weeks ahead of the UK. Okay. Right. Granted the Italian and the British population are quite similar and, uh, point taken in terms of the size of the US, but hopefully, the, as you said, your states will start following uh, the tri-state trends. And we, we, if you look at Italy now and you look at continental Europe, they're open. They're open yep. for tourism. The, the planes are going from, there's tourists going from the UK uh, to Spain, for example. Uh, Croatia has kept its doors open throughout most of this pandemic because um, Tourism is such a big key, and, and we do, and uh, I was listening to the podcast last week and the week before. And when you're talking about em empty hotels, it's worrying. It is really worrying. So, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's it's pretty interesting. I mean, in the UK, there's been I, I was checking today, uh, just over in total, two hundred ninety-six thousand positive cases of COVID nineteen, and the current death rate is just shy of just shy over forty-six. Uh, and a half thousand deaths, but the daily increase today was 53. So I remember the days when the daily increase were in, was in the thousands. So we've we've been through that. Uh, we've been through the hard 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 phase, and we're we're coming out at the other side. Um, but one thing that's also really positive that I wanted to share with you guys is testing. At first, testing for the UK was a really difficult. To get a test was really tough. You had to pretty much be ready to go into hospital to get a test. Whereas I know of someone uh, who on Monday found out that one of their colleagues is um, was tested positive for COVID. And at 10 a.m. he found this out. And by 12 p.m. he was getting a test done. And 7 a.m. the next day he got the results. Unfortunately, the results were he, he, he had tested negative. So now in terms of how we're getting tested here in the UK is really good because obviously you can then take measures uh, to protect you and yours um, from that. And then, uh, oh, and today as well, it was announced that in, in the UK, we're opening 200 new test centers uh, to prepare for a second wave because 
no one knows how it's going to be when the weather turns, takes a turn in the winter time. So Vivek, what is in your neighborhood and in your friend group and, you know, you know, the, the white collar office worker world, what's the vibe? I mean, are people sick of this? Are they going out and, you know, meeting up with each other? Is everyone hunkered down at home in their masks? I mean, we are in our little tri-state area bubble here in New York, New Jersey, and Brooklyn. I say Brooklyn's not like it's not New York. Um, but what, what's it like over there? Is it, is it more open? Yeah, so in places like London, um, obviously the capital, places are now opening. Pubs were open two weeks ago. I, I, I had to chain myself to my front door to not go on the first day and wait for things to calm down before I, I had my first nice, refreshing, cold pint. Um, shops are open, people are wearing masks when they go out and our Prime Minister is talking about make, uh, making wearing of masks mandatory in enclosed uh, spaces. In places up north in the Midlands, because um, the rate was not as high, they are slightly behind uh, London in terms of where they're at in terms of like wearing masks, for example. So when, I, when I've been up to the Midlands, not as many people are wearing masks when, they, when you do go out, but as when, when I've recently visited, they have started. So they're following the London trend. In terms of the vibe, people just want to get out and see people. So it started with, you'd go to a friend's garden. That was allowed. Now it's, let's meet our friends in the pub. Now it's, let's go shopping with our friends, which is all great for the UK economy because we're now spending money that um, we previously didn't for the last four months. All right, so uh, with remittance data for July nearing completion, we have new numbers in delinquencies that we released in Tripwire this week. What does the data show us, Manus? Um, it's very interesting. It's uh, at this point where, as we're recording this, we're about 80 or 85% having reported. We put out some numbers Thursday morning, July 23rd for our Tripwire readers. Um, if you don't get our Tripwire, you should contact us and. and and we will um, talk about making sure that you have it. The um, data is messy, but it's positive. So let's go through it. This is a little bit of, of deep dive. Um, so I apologize in advance for, for some of the uh, heavy number side of it. But the early indications are that delinquencies will actually fall considerably in July. And by considerably, I mean by maybe more than 30 basis points. If you recall, we were at 10.32% last month, which narrowly missed an all-time record. I think this month we could come in at under 10%. Eight billion in loans have cured this month, meaning they were delinquent last month, and now they are some version of not delinquent now. By some version, it means it's either fully current in grace period or beyond period, or beyond grace period. How does that $8 billion in cured break down? So we saw a billion four in loans that were extended. That was dominated by a couple of big loans, including the Destiny Mall in upstate New York and the Fashion Place loan that made up a big chunk of that. We had 3.4 billion that went back to current. So they were 30 or 60 or 90 days delinquent last month, and now they are current, not even in grace period. It's hard to get our arms around how many of those got forbearances. That 3.4 billion totaled 185 separate loans. For only about 10% were we able to distill the fact that these things had gotten some kind of relief, either... Um, payment delays, or use of reserves to fund p &I. If that were the case, the loan should have stayed with a paid-to date of April or May, but the paid-to date was advanced. So our expectation is that for the 90% for which the servicer or special servicer were silent on these, we think that there's a wave of loans that relieve, received relief but for which we don't know it yet. Of that 3.4, it could be something like 3 billion of it had gotten forbearances and we just don't know it definitively yet. Um, there's another 1.2 billion that went from delinquent to um, beyond grace period. 
another 200 million, which went from delinquent to in grace period. And then we have 1.9 billion that went current, but whose paid to date did not advance. So the Queen Center, we talked about that last week, was one of them, the Atrium Mall loan. Those would appear to be also, in addition to the 10% we referred to before, those would appear to be loans that were foreborn in um, sometime in the last three months, I would say. So we get this question all the time. A lot of our readers come in, they ping us by email, they pick up the phone and call us, help us out here. Um, so the headline is 8 billion in cures, hard to get our sense around how many got forbearances, delinquency rate should fall when the final numbers are posted. So uh, I'm looking at some of my numbers here and you know, I see the same thing, right? Uh, delinquency is coming down slightly. Now, 30 basis points used to be a big deal when the delinquency rate was like 2.5%, but now going from 10.32 to 10.02 doesn't seem that big of a deal. It's definitely a big deal that the direction is changing, but something to mention, at least in what I'm seeing, is that the special servicing rate is still increasing month over month. So that might, you know, that might be new loans kind of added to the, the hopper of specially serviced, or it might just be the loans that have cured are staying in special servicing because they're still going through the forbearance process or they went through the forbearance process, but they're staying in special servicing until they go through the entire forbearance period. Right. right? So I would say this is not the beginning for those that are wondering of, a, of an extended downturn. I think that this is downturn get, in the in the rate you mean in the delinquency rate right so we talked about reaching terminal delinquency velocity that we never expected to see you know rates go up three and four percent per month going forward we expected it to level off as it turns out we kind of more than leveled off this month but what we're facing in august september october is the people that got relief that relief ends so one of two things is going to happen there'll be a second phase of forbearances, which will keep a lid on the delinquency rate, or the servicers and special servicers will not be as accommodative in the fall. They'll say things are opening, you should be able to make these payments back. And this dip will turn into another increase, although I don't see the, these increases going from 10 to 13 to 16 to 19. It would be more like a 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 12 to 13. Because I think, as we've said in the past, if you didn't need relief in April, May, or June, why would you need it in August or September when things presumably are getting better? Vivek, yesterday you hosted a European CMBS and CLO update. Let's first talk about CMBS. Give us an overview of what that market has looked like in the last few months. Yeah, it was a great webinar. Um, and in terms of the last few months of CM, European CMBS, it, the market came to a standstill. So the, for those that know, the European CMBS market never really revived itself after the last financial crisis. However, in 2018, the market made its resurgence, the pricing just started to work. So since 2018, each year, we've had about 5 billion euros uh, worth of issuance. And in the first quarter of 2020, we had 1 billion euros. We were ready to start to really have a, a great year. Um, obviously, when COVID hit, it then became, um, it came to a standstill. But that being said, we know that there's a strong European pipeline with some deals being priced imminently. And uh, we, we held a vote yesterday in terms of what our audience thought um, the 2020 European CMBS uh, would be, issuance would be. And the, the winning vote came out at three to four billion euros, which I think um, is conservative. There were some people, you know me, I'm very positive about European CMBS, and I still think we'll hit the five billion euro mark. Um, but obviously only time will tell. But just going into a little bit more detail about um, European CMBS and the reason why um, there is a slight worry um, within the marketplace is COVID-19 has really affected the timing and the amount uh, of payments by the tenants. There's been an increase in rent delinquencies and increased vacancies, which has had a knock-on effect of the consequences of the pandemic. 
And of course, this will ultimately affect the borrower's ability to recover the rent. And there is also no guarantee that the tenant will remain solvent as a result of the poor performance of the tenant's business and its ability to perform its obligations. We were talking about um, the business rates that are being increased. And it seems like these struggling businesses are, are being attacked from different, different places. So, and what we've really learned from the last crisis is that uh, it caused a significant dislocation in the European CMBS market. And there's no real assurance that this dislocation is going to have a negative impact on the perception of European CMBS which then obviously affects the market value of the notes of the bonds, and it could have a real knock-on effect. And then you're looking um, at the value of the CMBS in the secondary market. That being said, we have seen an increase um, in inquiries from our prospects in the Middle East and Asia in looking for distressed opportunities in both European CMBS and US CMBS and US commercial real estate which I think is very, um, very interesting. So, uh, you know, we at TREP model every, basically every CMBS that exists, right? Euro, US, even the couple of Japanese deals that, that happened years and years ago. But it just seems like the European market just cannot get the timing right, right? They really yeah. um, started to hum in 06, you know, 07, and then the financial crisis hit, right? And it just totally walloped the market and shut it down. Uh, and now, just like you said, we started to get some momentum there. We started to securitize some deals and then bang, COVID hits. And I think, you know, from what I've seen and heard, you know, in the data and also just talking to people over there like you and others, that the, let's say, uniformity or the standardization or the uh, transparency of the market is just, you know, many, many uh, le levels behind the U.S., right? And I would say, you know, to go back to our, to our wordplay of last week, the opacity of the European market is extreme, like, compared to the U.S. I mean, the U.S. CRE and CMBS market is like, you know, the, the New York Stock Exchange compared to, you know, some guy writing on a chalkboard over there, maybe. Maybe that's okay. a little harsh, but... I don't know if you, if you feel the same way, Vivek. Absolutely. Um, so one point that we, we talked about yesterday in the webinar was a new regulation that was brought in in 2019, which is to really try and bring standardization across uh, European secure, securitized asset classes. Um, so it's called the STS framework, which stands for Simple, Transparent and Standardized. Now for the listeners, please bear with me for the next couple of minutes. Um, because we all know talking about regulation uh, can be quite intense. But essentially, all structured asset classes have to comply with this new way of reporting and are also given capital relief treatment um, when complying with this new, new, new way of reporting. That being said, CMBS and CLOs were not included in, in, in the capital uh, relief treatment, but um, public CMBS and CLO issuers still have to report back in the template, in the format set by ESMA, the European regulator. So it's mandatory that um, they, now, they now abide to this new format, this new way of reporting, and that's coming into force in uh, September of this year. It has been delayed so the, because what happened was when the template came out, a lot of the fields that had to be filled in just did not apply to CMBS and CLOs. So, Great industry bodies like Cressy in Europe really uh, got the market together to understand what amendments needed made to that template. Um, and they managed to get a, a reiteration made. So um, that will hopefully bring some sort of standardized reporting to the CMBS market. But you're absolutely right. The European market has always been an opaque market um, and it will be difficult to change. But I think now with this new regulation, we're on the start, we're on the right path for that change. With a lot of focus on retail during this whole shutdown, uh, we've put out more research in this particular sector than ever, specifically the CMBX6 uh, piece that we did an update on. And we also did a top five retail loans that were 90 plus days delinquent. What are we looking at in terms of uh, some of that information, Manus? Well, when you talk about the broader market, you know, it's bifurcated in by property type 
and it's bifurcated by who your tenants are, right? So across the entire market, you see the have nots being the hotel and the retail loans, right? The borrowers behind those loans mm -hmm. and the guys that have held up well office, uh, industrial multifamily thus far. So uh, those borrowers on, on the hotel side and the retail side, just, you know, if I were one of them, I would be on fumes at this point. I don't know how you cope with on the retail side, the closing, the reopening, the reclosing like you had in California and so forth that uh, that has to be brutal. You know, Apple did the same, right? Opened, reclosed again. And on the hotel side, you know, you still see a lot of people out there with sub 20% occupancies. But within those two hammered sections, you really see even sub segment sub segments of haves and have nots. So what we saw was we talked about before the 8 billion in loans that got relief and cured. And when they do cure and when they do get forbearances and so forth, that's kind of a bet uh, by the borrower and a bet or a vote of confidence by the special service or that these guys are worthy of the relief and that they'll be able to muddle through. And on the other side, you have this whole swath of hotel and retail loans that were 30 days delinquent in May, 60 days in June, now 90 days in July. And you're seeing fewer and fewer in between. So it's, it's kind of barbelled. Some getting the relief and, and having cured. And then this whole other segment, which is you know, kind of waiting for a miracle in the old uh, Grateful Dead ticket seeker uh, vernacular, <laughs> right? That, you know, they're hoping for a bailout from Congress. They're hoping the economy turns. They hope, and th they hope things open. Um, but, you know, I don't know how long some of these guys can, can hold on. Well, I'm also waiting for the, uh, the haves in terms of property type to start feeling the pain because they, they, they will, unless we do get this vaccine going and we get uh, reopening happening and people back to school. But I know that, you know, our office building has been empty or 90% empty for the last four months. Right. And that's probably true for 80% of 90% of the offices in Midtown and, you know, lower Manhattan and other uh, major cities. And, there are a lot of good tenants and a lot of good corporations that are continuing to perform well and probably pay their rent. But I do think that there's going to be a, another year or two of, you know, seeing the long tail effects of this, right? Multifamily rents in Manhattan going down and other major cities, office lease rates going down, occupancies going down, all that type of stuff. So I don't mean to be a, a Debbie Downer, but I just think that the effects of this are going to be felt by the other half of the world it's just going to take longer and they won't be as drastic but it's just they will be felt when you talk about cmbx6 specifically martha you asked about that um for those that don't get our blogs every week for the last six or seven weeks we've been highlighting a cmbx series as to what makes it unique how it's performed in delinquency terms what its cost of insurance has been at the triple b minus level and so forth We've talked about this at length. CMBX6 is really where rubber meets the road. It's where on the long side, we've seen Putnam and Alliance Bernstein bet that they could make money uh, writing insurance uh, on the triple B minus. And then you have M MP Securitize, Carl Icahn, uh, before that Alder Hill uh, taking the short side of it. And what we have right now is, and the reason it's it's been so heavily watched is, is it's, its exposure to mall loans and retail overall, 40% retail among its collateral, about 20% are mall loans. And everybody now is just watching. A lot of these loans have gone delinquent. They're reaching their maturity dates. They're with the special servicers. Um, people are waiting for whether institutional support for each individual loan will come through, right? There's Brookfield loans or Simon loans, obviously they are higher end um, down the quality curve. You have CBL, which filed for bankruptcy, or I should say is expected to file for bankruptcy. They have an awful lot of CMBS exposure, a lot of CMBX6 exposure. We wrote about that earlier this week. Um, their 
$76.5 million Park Plaza loan uh, went REO this month. It's, a, it's, backing a, it's backed by a Little Rock, Arkansas mall. So, you know, they kind of gave up on that. They said they're no longer going to, or we're no longer going to try to modify that loan. They have several others um, that we're watching. The West, Count, West County Center, Des Perez, Missouri, uh, $112 million loan. Coastal Grand, another $112 million loan uh, backed by a Myrtle Beach property. Arbor, Pro, Arbor Place in Douglasville, Georgia, $105 million loan. So if they were to file for bankruptcy, all of a sudden, you know, all bets are off as to what they're going to try to keep and what they're going to try to just throw back the keys on. So that we did write a story, or maybe we mentioned it in the podcast, about um, a mall in Hawaii going bankrupt. Um, and I have to shout out another lawyer, loyal listener, Bob C. He's a software developer for us, and he said he wants to go in, have these, uh, buy that property, bring it back to glory, and he'll move out there and continue to code and write software for TREP. Uh, so if anyone's interested in that, let us know. I said he should go out there and turn it from a mall into like a coder's uh, nirvana, a work from home software development nirvana. Imagine that. You can have, you know, super sanitized cubes and plexiglass all over the place and, you know, go inside and put your headphones on and code for 10 hours and then go surfing on the Surf. beach. Yeah. Right. Maybe. So, Bob, uh, let me know if you can raise the funds for that. We've talked about office space being a sector to watch in the coming months as companies pivot to remote working longer term. In Globe Street this week, Global Workplace Analytics estimated that companies can save about $11,000 per employee with a flexible work from home arrangement. And of course, employees save money in terms of their commuting cost. What's the sentiment and impact of the pandemic on office work in the UK? That's really interesting. Um, and I was reading up today that there was a study that was conducted of 2,000 firms globally and the UK portion of those 2,000 firms. 50% of those UK firms are actually considering to shrink their offices and 44% were con considering a reduction in the actual size of the property. And then uh, reading, I love statistics, reading another survey um, which, which interviewed 5,000 employees who were made to work from home, only 13% actually wanted to go back to the office full time. And 87%, uh, the remaining 87% actually wanted uh, the flexibility to work more uh, remotely. And it was interesting because there was one quote from an investment director, a large insurance fund, who said that we've experienced five years of change in five months as the pandemic has brought trends that may have emerged anyway, but over a much longer time horizon. And I thought that that sums up what we've all experienced on both sides of the pond um, pretty, pretty well. Um, then there was, there, was a, the, there was another article that was talking about how 30 of the biggest employees, employees of the City of London were telling police that they only intend to bring a maximum of 40% of their workforce back. And that's purely down to the fact of social distancing and having to work within confined spaces. And personally, if you ask me, I'm not looking forward to getting on a tube again uh, until there's a vaccine. And I, I think that my view is shared by many of my peers here in the UK. And it's really interesting because now we're talking about properties and rent, but in London, there's not much demand for, uh, for renting uh, flats anymore, apartments, because people are thinking for that amount of money, I could rent a house with a garden in the countryside and take the train in once or twice a week. So that seems to be the general consensus over here in the UK. Martha, did you ever call somebody up for a dinner party and the first question they ask is, what are you serving? And then the second question they ask is, who else is coming? <laughs> right? They, it's like the rudest response. They get off the list. Get. Yeah, they right? get off you the list. Got, I'm envisioning our office manager, Christine O. If we go back and it's, you know, 25% week one, 25% week two, 25% week three, she will be inundated with what 25% am I in with? Who else <laughs> is in my 25%? Can I change teams? <laughs> Can I change teams? 
<laughs> you know, don't put me with this guy. Don't put me with that guy. You know, and I might be that guy. That's the worst part of it all. Don't put me with Manus. You all know who you are out there. Yeah, well, you know, Joe mentioned 10% of our uh, physical location is actually occupied by the tenants. That is not a swag. That is actually a true number that we were told. And what's interesting about that is that when we look at uh, TREP publishes, re, uh, you know, occupancy numbers in office, when we look at the occupancy trend, it's pretty plateaued and it isn't moving downward yet. So it's masking what Joe is talking about, which is people are not at the office. It's the shadow vacancy rate. It's, the sh it's just like the shadow delinquency rate. All right, looking at CLOs. This week we looked at publicly listed companies with CLO exposure that were battered in the first half of 2020. What were the results? It was a busy week for CLOs across the board. Um, our colleague Jody, who is another one that we have to have on one of these days to talk about this. Before I get into that particular research piece, she has been incredibly prescient in her research in terms of pointing out companies that were either pulling in restructuring advisors or were rumored to go into bankruptcy. She's really had her finger on the pulse there. Just over the last couple days, um, California Resources, we wrote about them months ago. They filed for bankruptcy late last week. Today, Asina Retail, I think we started writing about them in uh, April. Um, they filed for bankruptcy today. They are the owner of Ann Taylor and other um, small clothing operators. Always a great place to get your mother a scarf on Christmas Eve. Uh, when you had run out of time. Um, <laughs> Global Eagle, another one that filed for bankruptcy this week, they provide Wi-Fi services to airlines. They have a $540, $500 million um, term loan that is in our TREP database. It's been trading around 60 uh, recently. So these are all things that uh, Jody had flagged months ago. So if you're not getting our weekly blog, kind of ping us and we'll make sure that you're getting that. But she did zero in on four companies that had seen huge sell-offs in their equity prices over the last couple of months to see how their term loans had held up. Carnival Cruise Lines, Cody, Xerox, and United. She did a deep dive on those to see if the uh, leverage loan prices had mirrored the downturn in the equity prices over the last couple of months. And uh, not surprisingly, they had. So a lot of good stuff this week um, in terms of research, not in a lot of great headlines. Another thing I know that she'll cover this week is the Las Vegas Sands, which came out with earnings this week, revenue down a remarkable 97% between its properties in Las Vegas and Macau. So file this under um, hindsight is 2020. But we did have a story in Trepwire this week about the S&P downgrading Renfro Corporation. Renfro Corporation manufactures socks. Now, as I sit here in my home office in the attic, I look down at my feet and they are unsocked. And I guarantee you that the, the wearing of socks has probably gone down 75% because of the work from home click. The wearing of uh, sandals and comfy uh, Crocs, Clippers. and if you're a weirdo, Crocs, and if you're uh, a comfy guy, what are those ones with like the sheepskin inside, uh, the sheep fur? Uh, oh. So it's just yeah, one of those, I it's see. another one of those things, right? Like Zoom, like it was so obvious when you look back on it that this stock was going to skyrocket. It should have been so obvious that somebody manufacturing clothes that nobody wears uh, when they're at home, maybe we should start thinking about other types you know, khaki manufacturers, button-down shirt manufacturers, those types of things. Well, I think things. it's razors, hair gel, right? Things like that, that, you know, how often do you just pull on a hat now? Yeah, right? What are, you trying right? to what say are we down to, this? shaving twice a week, maybe? You're looking at me right now? Is that, is that why you're saying this? <laughs> Call you the shadow. <laughs> I think he is. And uh, Vivek, just to get an update on CLOs from the UK point of view. Sure. So I'll provide a, a general European update for CLO. So we've seen an 11 billion euros worth of issuance thus far in 2020. Um, and at this point 
last year, there was 19 billion. Obviously, we all know why um, there's a slight shortfall, but there is, um, activity has definitely picked up and uh, we've been covering them really well over the last couple of weeks um, in our weekly outlook. What's interesting, talking about clothing companies, uh, Joe and Manus, uh, we were, we showed a loan of Zara, the clothing, um, the, the Spanish clothing giant, and they have th their loan, the price of their loan obviously dropped um, come March and April, and a lot of CLO managers uh, were selling as it was dropping, but now it's returned and the pricing is now back to pre-COVID levels, and we're seeing that quite a lot. And interestingly enough, I read this morning that Ted Baker are now making their clothes more accessible. And by accessible, they mean they're gonna be selling their clothes on Ocado. So of course, everyone's now using online uh, grocery shopping and whatnot. And sooner or later, you're gonna, as well as getting your milk and eggs and bread, you'll be able to get your Ted Baker t-shirt or Ted Baker shorts <laughs> to wear around the house. Let's turn to banks briefly. This week was the 10th anniversary of Dodd-Frank legislation, and our team will be providing a summary, putting that into context. But is there anything that we've learned in the decades since the great financial crisis? Well, we've surely learned how to uh, <laughs> scrape together as much data as possible, build models. Um, We've learned all about PDs and LGDs and logistic regressions and all that type of stuff. Uh, and I think what, you know, as much as I don't love, you know, tons of regulation, I think this Dodd-Frank and CCAR and stress testing and capital ratio minimums and all those types of things have allowed the large and, mid and mid-sized banks to weather this storm very well. So I think that, uh, you know, going forward, it would not surprise me if we see kind of a resurgence in um, regulatory oversight on stress testing and capital planning and things like that. I already know for a fact that there is at least one or there may, may, may have heard about two um, of the banking regulators that are now asking their banks to uh, kind of re-bone up on their uh, commercial real estate stress testing. So uh, luckily we're in a much better position to do that now and we have a lot more expertise. Um, and you know, depending on the election in November, you could, if there's a change in the administration, you could see uh, you know, a re-implementation of a lot of the very strict guidelines. I used to joke that, you know, that the years from 2011 to 2014 was the golden age of modelers, right? right. Every bank needed to bring in quants and modelers to to do this, all this Dodd-Frank stress testing and regression analysis and, and so forth. And I do think that we will enter another golden age of modelers coming forward because I think that everybody will look back and say, all right, we need to recalibrate these things on the basis of this new black swan that we've identified and, and how did this impact every property type and what was the loss severity and what was the downturn in occupancy and, and so forth. But I do think that whether we are going to see banks uh, be put in a vice or if we get a light touch will be a function of who wins in November, right? I think that if we see a change in administration and a turnover of Congress, a sweep by the Democrats, if you will, um, it'll be a vice and that vice will be squeezed very hard in terms of regulation. And I think that if it's a mixed Congress um, or, you know, a return of a Republican presidency, it will be a much lighter touch. Well, it'll be interesting. I mean, the, the last thing I'll say on this, because we're running long, I know, is that, uh, you know, when we were selling our data to banks in order to build all these stress testing models, they always would say, you know, how far does your data go back? Does it include the great financial crisis? Does it include the recession? And we'd always say, yeah, of course, it goes back almost 20 years. Now they're going to say, does it include the COVID recession? Or there's probably going to be some, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what they're going to name it. You know, the pandemic penundrum, the, you know, the COVID catastrophe, like whatever it's going to be going forward that we, that we call it. It's going to have to have alliteration, no doubt. Yep. And for those of you who are sports fans, and I'm looking at you guys right now, uh, or you just need a break from your Zoom meetings, baseball, hockey, and basketball exhibition games are back this week all with new protocols. 
And Vivek, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that soccer had already begun. So I will. Soccer? Yeah, soccer? What's well, soccer? You mean, you mean football? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So which of these are your faves? Uh, we've got to go to football, aka soccer. But for all the avid football fans, as you know, Liverpool won the league. Um, and lift, they actually lifted the trophy last night in front of no fans at Anfield. And they spent £1 million on fireworks. And apparently there was some financing involved there too. Uh, Norwich has been, have been relegated and there are still three teams that could be relegated with Sunday being the last day of the season. And just, just putting it in terms of what that means for teams that are relegated. If you're in the Premier League, the teams get an average of £80 million, um, of course, from sponsorship, TV deals and whatnot. United, Man United, Manus, I know uh, your son's an avid United supporter. They drew last night. Um, and they're actually fighting for a Champions League spot to uh, finish in the top four. And they will be fighting against Leicester City. And Leicester and United are playing on Sunday. So it's all going to go down to the wire as to who will actually get that glorious Champions League spot for next year. So, and the final thing I want to <laughs> mention is my team, Coventry City, were promoted to the, Premier, uh, to the Championship. <laughs> That was Joe snoring in case you missed it. Let's talk about the Rangers, baby. August 1st, we're back. New York Rangers. The hockey fan. You know, I was uh, watching some baseball earlier this week, and I'm not sure I can do it. You know, no fans, piped in noise. It just all felt like an exhibition game. And maybe it'll change when they start playing real games today. I'm not really sure, but... You know, the cardboard cutouts. I was going to say, are you going to buy a cutout for yourself? Maybe I'm we'll buy it for a, you. I'm not going to do a, a cutout. I, it just, it seemed weird. So I think that if I'm going to follow it, and I am a big baseball fan. I love my baseball. I Believe it or not, I might go radio. I mm. might just have it on, you know, on my old gray, um, pull up the antenna, Perfect. transistor radio, put it on in the background. So you just don't know that it's empty seats and you don't know that it's all canned you know fox was saying they were going to put fake fans in the stands you know via cgi and have them all like do the wave and jump up when something happened and stuff like that you know i i don't know um we'll have to see we'll we'll come back to you next week and i'll let you know so i have one thing that i wanted to uh to to tell you guys i in honor of vivek and you may cut this keegan we'll see in honor of Vivek being on the podcast, I, I was thinking about one of my famous or one of my favorite movies, which was The Darkest Hour about Winston Churchill during World War II. And he had that great speech at the end, we will fight in the land, we will fight in the seas and so on. So I just created one uh, for today's world. And uh, just bear with me here. So even though large tracts of Arizona and many old and famous states have fallen or may fall into the grip of the virus and all the odious apparatus of pandemic rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in masks. We shall fight in the labs and classrooms. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the home office. We shall defend our people, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight using bleaches. We shall fight on the UPS loading docks. We shall fight in the Zooms and in the streets and we shall fight in the hills of Cambridge. We shall never surrender. Wow. I okay. love, love it. Love it. Amen. That's you a, did Winston Churchill proud, Joe. That's right. Uh, the Light Joe a McBride. cigar. Yeah, the Joe McBride rallying cry. And with that, we have to close. Thank you, Vivek, for joining us today and offering your insights. Thanks to our producer, Keegan St. Ange, who had a good time throughout this whole one. Join us next week as we look at what's happening during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question,